Welcome to our audience. I'm pleased and privileged to be moderating this session today. It will be a hybrid session, uh, but no alarm, just meaning that we'll have both uh, panelists here in, uh, in, in the studio in Tallinn and uh, panelists um, connected um, uh, from remote. And I'm really pleased to welcome our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, an extraordinary mix of academics and uh, a legal, um, uh, legal advisor uh, who have been working both at operational and strategic level. So in, studio we have, in the studio we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anastasia Roberts, um, Dr. Adrian Venables, and joining from remote, Dr. Monica Kamiska and Colonel uh, Gary Korn. So welcome to SciCon and thank you all to be with us today. This session will look both at an international humanitarian law um, framework applicable uh, to cyber operations, to analyze how uh, seeding uh, human control uh, to artificial uh, intelligence-enabled capabilities may affect the existing uh, in framework of the law of armed conflict. And it will, this will be the topic of the first, uh, of the first paper. But we look also, and this we go to the second paper, a peacetime regime of cyber activities to explore with our panelists um, the possibility to draw inspiration from international humanitarian law, principle of distinction and discrimination to transpose their protection uh, into a non-binding norm of responsible state behavior. So it will be a sort of the Lex Ferenda exercise, if I can call it this way. And I can already anticipate that in the panel, someone will recommend caution in this sort of exercise. So this promises to be indeed a very interesting panel and with an in-depth academic discussion. But before we start, very briefly, a um, few online house rules. Uh, speakers will talk for no more than 15 minutes. Uh, you are free to submit um, written questions uh, via the chat during, during the talk. We'll collect them and give the speakers a few minutes uh, uh, to answer after each talk. Um, at the end of the session, then, we will open the floor to a more general discussion, and you will be free uh, to uh, ask the panelists, all the panelists, uh, your questions. Of course, the panelists are free also to ask questions to each other. Right, without adding anything, anything further, I will now introduce the first two speaker of the day uh, who will jointly present their paper, Lieutenant Colonel Anastasia Roberts. Welcome, Anastasia. She has been a legal officer in the British Army for 16 years um, and served both in Afghanistan and Iraq. She is currently posted uh, to the Office of Legal um, Affairs at SHAPE, a light command operation, and as part of the operational law branch. Her area of expertise is legal support to cyber, intelligence and information operations. And I would also add that she's a pillar of the Lockshield exercise white legal team, every year authoring indeed the most complex and I would say feared uh, index. Dr. Uh, Adrian Venables, welcome Adrian. Uh, he's a senior researcher at the Tallinn University of Technology since 2018. He specializes in cyber strategy and its role in influence operations. Adrian served in the Royal Navy for 24 years as a communications, warfare, and intelligence officer. As a commander in the Royal Naval Reserve, he still supports UK cyber resilience activity in the Baltic region. So, Anna and Adrian, your paper provides an excellent, I would say, overview on, of arguments in favor and against um, the military uses of, uh, for artificial intelligence uh, in kinetic targeting and suggesting some original ways of moving the debate forward. So I would say that the floor is yours. Pleased to hear you. Thanks, Max. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, we'd like to say that we're really, really thrilled to be here. Thank you very much for having us, Max. So, first of all, I thought it might be helpful, we thought it might be helpful to explain why exactly we wrote this paper. And this is because in our reading, in watching media coverage of this issue, 
we were really struck that there seemed to be an overemphasis and overfocus on lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws. And this excessive focus on laws was detracting from broader arguments um, or broader discussion, I should say, about the use of autonomous AI capability by the military in armed conflict. And moreover, these arguments about laws and IHL compliance were often very emotional, um, talking about killer robots, Terminator-style uh, machines, and sometimes quite one-sided. So our purpose in writing this paper is actually just to advocate a more balanced approach to this really important issue by bringing together all of the different arguments and looking at them from both sides. Thank you. So for those of you who aren't so familiar with the IHL framework or the law of armed conflict, as we, we call it in the military, I thought that I would just really briefly set out the IHL framework for targeting to, to help our conversation. The framework is underpinned by the four fundamental principles that you see on the slide. And of these, the two most important principles for the purposes of this discussion are humanity and distinction. Oh, rather, sorry, distinction and proportionality. Distinction. Distinction means that we must be able to draw a very clear difference between civilians and civilian objects and military targets. And this is, of course, because civilians and civilian objects must not be attacked. They are protected under IHL. Accordingly, when planning an attack, a military commander must do everything possible to confirm that a target is military and not, in fact, civilian. The military commander must also take all feasible precautions when planning an attack to make sure that there are no incidental civilian losses. However, as we know, this is sometimes unavoidable. And this is where the principle of proportionality comes into play. Proportionality says or, or dictates that civilian losses, incidental civilian losses, must not be excessive in relation to the expected military advantage. And so on this basis, the military commander is, is conducting a, a weighing exercise between the competing humanitarian and military interests. But what is key to, to draw from uh, what we've just talked about is that it is the military commander's own judgment and experience that count. Uh, the military commander makes the decisions about distinction and proportionality, drawing on his, his own judgment, his experience. Um, and this is a key point in this discussion, and we'll talk about it further. The military commander is, of course, I should say, advised at all times by his legal officer, his intelligence officer, uh, the targeteers, but ultimately is the military commander's decision on these issues, and the military commander is accountable. And on that basis, it's also important to note that attack must be kept under constant review. So if the distinction and proportionality assessment changes, then the attack must be suspended or cancelled. And finally, on this slide, I want to mention Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions. And this mandates that there must be a legal review of all new weapons, means and methods of warfare. Now, there is debate on the scope of this provision and who it applies to. But the key takeaway is that IHL already has an inbuilt mechanism to deal with new technology. So we looked at three particular aspects um, looking at, at the uh, use of autonomous artificial intelligence. The first is, is laws. And there is no official definition for what a laws is. So what you see on the slide is our definition for the purposes of the paper. And this is essentially a, a weapon system which independently selects and uses force against the target based upon its own algorithms, machine learning, taking inputs from the environment, making a decision, and targeting without a human in the loop. The second element we looked at was intelligence, surveillance, and, and reconnaissance. And this would have an autonomous system being able to assimilate more information than a human would be able to do, would be able to assess it against its machine learning algorithms and come up with solutions which would assist a targeting process. The final element we looked at was information operations, 
And that is where we look at information as the weapon and as the tool. And this is where we would look at mostly perhaps online information and looking at um, social media, looking at some of the sentiment analysis. And this is where the information is, is interpreted. And using that, we can then identify, or the machine can identify, the best way to affect the will, understanding, and capability of a target, again, without a human in the loop. So moving on to the arguments about the use of autonomous AI capability, um, looking first of all from the perspective of the law. And the key legal concern expressed about autonomous AI capability in the military context is that such capability simply can't comply with IHL, and particularly the principles of proportionality and distinction. And this is because IHL relies upon that human judgment, experience, and control that we talked about earlier. And there is no doubt that the issue of distinction is, is a challenging one, even for humans. In the types of conflicts we see now, the adversary is very often indistinguishable from the civilian population and will habitually alternate between targetable status when taking a direct part in hostilities and non-targetable status. When assessing whether someone is taking a direct part in hostilities, we have to look not just at the activity that person is carrying out, but also at the broader operational context. So for example, how will a machine be able to distinguish between celebratory weapons fire and hostile weapons fire? How will a machine be able to distinguish between um, somebody carrying a weapon for hostile purposes or somebody taking a weapon to a police station as part of a weapons amnesty. And the point is that commentators say that to be able to do this, you need to apply human um, intelligence, uh, to be able to understand somebody's state of mind. And there is some strength in that argument. Um, and similarly, in relation to proportionality issues, how is a machine going to be able to assess the value of human life against a military target, noting that the value of a military target is going to be context-dependent and, and will change according to the operational circumstances. To respond to that, within um, IHL targeting rules, it is not actually specifically stated that there has to be a, a human in the loop. And so the key point is, can a capability comply with the rules? If so, it is legal. And to assist with that, an Article 36 legal review could be conducted, and if compliant, then it may be used. We can argue that actually autonomous systems can enhance the legal compliance. For example, in ISR, we could have improved target identification. Using sophisticated algorithms and machine learning, it could be able to differentiate between a pipe bomb and just someone laying a pipe by the side of the road. F within information operations, by using um, highly complex machine learning, it may be possible in a very timely manner to identify the best way to um, affect the capability, will, and understanding of a target audience to enable them to behave in a certain way, such as moving out of a target area or indeed affecting the, uh, the intended target to stay where he is, where he is safe to be targeted. And for laws, the key point is that if a system is constantly monitoring its targeting process, it is able to abort or delay an attack according to its algorithms and how it chooses to, uh, to respond to certain stimuli. But even if it can be demonstrated that a capability can comply with IHL, and particularly proportionality and distinction, there is still significant opposition to the use of such capability on ethical grounds. And this is because it is felt that seeding life and death decisions to a machine will lead to the dehumanization of warfare, with military decision-making stripped of all emotion. It is also suggested by some commentators that human conscience often acts as a final barrier um, against taking life. 
An example of this, when I was in Afghanistan in 2009, the military commander there issued a policy um, which directed military personnel to exercise restraint in their use of force, even in situations where force could be legally applied and in situations where this would put yourself at risk or your colleagues. And this was to spare the civilian population. So this issue of conscience is important. Um, how will a machine without a conscience be able to determine when it is appropriate to exercise restraint? Of course, you could argue that in response to that, autonomous systems can actually improve international humanitarian law compliance in that humans are emotional and in the stress of battle, they may perform and they may, may react um, by fear, anger, exhaustion, depending upon what they've seen, how they feel, they may be distracted. Of course, an autonomous system isn't affected by that. It responds objectively in accordance with its algorithms, in accordance with its machine learning, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, irrespective of what is happening around it. And so you're going to get a more consistent response in any given environment. Now, moving on to, to technical arguments, it has been shown that um, autonomous systems can be biased, and that depends upon the training data they're given. If you're using training data that was designed to be used in one theater, in another theater, the system may not respond as you anticipate or as you would want to be compliant. The system may be unreliable, unpredictable, because it's not working to a set program, it's machine learning, and it's responding in accordance with the algorithms and stimuli, it could be unpredictable. And because of that, there is an issue with accountability in that if it responds in a certain way, it may be impossible to actually explain how it came to a particular decision because it's just not working through lines of code, it's interpreting the situation and coming to its own decisions. But of course, my answer to this is that IHL already has an inbuilt mechanism to catch issues such as this. If uh, an Article 36 legal review is conducted correctly, there should be no question of a capability exhibiting uh, characteristics such as Adrian has explained ever coming into service because the review is there to stop that. Um, Building on this, I would also stress the importance of involving military legads in the capability development process as early as possible. And this is to ensure that IHL compliance is baked in to the design process as opposed to an afterthought. And so finally, in, con in conclusion, we totally agree that AI in targeting the use of uh, autonomous AI capability does raise issues about IHL compliance. However, by the same token, some capability could in fact improve IHL compliance. And this is too important an argument to simply discard or gloss over, as some commentators do. The fact is that um, a capability must be judged on its own merits. We must avoid overgeneralization and supposition about what a capability, an autonomous AI capability, may or may not be able to do. As I have said, IHL already has a mechanism to address concerns about IHL compliance. And this is where, in our view, international efforts should really focus on strengthening that process and, of course, as I've said, lawyers should be involved early, as early as possible in the development. And, and finally, we would just like to, to reiterate that polarized emotional debate is unhelpful. In this really important topic, we need a sensible and balanced discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia and Adrian, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I have already uh, some questions aside for you, uh, for Adrian to start with. Um, we've been speaking of 
automated and autonomous capabilities. Could you clarify what is the difference and perhaps between them and perhaps later we can also examine uh, the possible implication in terms of an operational and legal implications? But now the difference on the difference between the two. Yes, of course, Max. Um, automated systems are commonly used in, in service now. Um, a good example would be a close-in weapon system. So it's a system where essentially you feed it a power supply and chilled water, you turn it on, and it will defend the ship, about the um, a sea whiz close-in weapon system. But that system works through lines of code, it will identify targets, it will track targets, and it will determine if it's a threat in accordance with a set of parameters which a human has coded based upon whether it's a crossing target, whether it's in a certain speed bracket, whether it's a, uh, uh, coming tra straight towards your, your ship at a certain height. But these are highly governed. An autonomous system, essentially you are teaching it how to learn. You're providing it with a number of algorithms in which you say this is what you need to interpret, and then you feed it training data, and then the system then looks at a different environment uses that own training data, and then determines whether or not it can, it, it can engage or, or make the, uh, the kinetic targeting. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. One question for uh, Anna. In your paper, you address the issue of the applicability um, to artificial intelligence used in uh, kinetic targeting of Article 36 of the Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions which require, as we know, and as you say, state parties to review new weapons, means or methods of warfare um, to ensure their compliance with IHL. When you examine this issue, uh, you offer also an analysis of three different um, potential military use of artificial intelligence uh, in the targeting process. Um, and you emphasize also the relevance of this differentiation for the possible, possible implication on the applicability of Article 36. So could you uh, uh, summarize a bit the outcome of this analysis with the particular um, reference to the implication of this uh, differentiation? I'll, I'll try. <laughs> Um, th the key issue with Article 36, is, as you know, is that AP1 itself does not contain a definition of what uh, a weapon is, what, mean what means are, and what methods are. It's quite easy to identify what a weapon is. So a laws would clearly be a weapon because it has that ability to, to, to use force to take human life. But what isn't quite so clear is is what a, a method of warfare is. In AP1, it talks about methods of warfare in relation to how a weapon is used. So it's all very weapons focused. But the point is that what we've just talked about with um, autonomous AI capability for use in ISR and IO for use in the legal targeting process, this brings those capabilities into the mix as well. And currently, I, I don't think it's very clear whether or not those, um, those capabilities should be subject to an Article 36 review. I mean, I think they should be. I think they are going to be supporting the targeting process, uh, and therefore, they should be reviewed. Because although the concern is voiced about laws, it's equally applicable to ISR and IO. For example, as Adrian discussed ISR capabilities, it could, an ISR capability could identify the wrong person. It could identify a civilian as a, as a target. Um, an IO capability could act perfidiously to entice um, a, a target into a particular area. So we need to make sure that these capabilities are as compliant with IHL as weapons. And this is where I think, in, as I said, international focus should, should really be. Does that help? Does that answer? Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Meanwhile, Mike. we have a question from the audience. Uh, should we consider um, artificial intelligence and machine learning decision making independent to the international humanitarian law and therefore the enemy support use of artificial intelligence and machine learning? Would you agree that ethical war fighters may lose the war? Uh, I'll, I'll start um, with that. I think having the moral high ground and being in the right 
is, is extremely important. Um, yes, you can sink to the lowest common denominator and fight dirty. However, in NATO, um, we are fighting legally, um, we are following the law, and of course, we do have a domestic audience at home that we have to influence and keep on side. And so we need to, um, to demonstrate globally that, uh, that NATO is a ethical, law-abiding alliance, and that it is not afraid of using um, the latest technology, machine learning, autonomous systems, however it does so in a responsible, ethical and legal manner. And absolutely, I, I agree with that. When we were discussing the ethical arguments, we weren't suggesting at any point that we, we shouldn't apply ethics in the use of force. As far as IHL is concerned, that the, the legality and the ethics are, are intertwined, as we know. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can add anything much more to <laughs> what Adrian said, to be honest, but, but you, I think it would be wrong to suggest that fighting ethically will lead to you losing the war. Fighting ethically can never lead to you losing a war if you have the, the moral high ground and the support of the, of the people that you are fighting for. Full enough. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anna. And we have uh, the last question for uh, this panel now. Um, could you comment on the concerns of a cyber attack or other interference with the artificial intelligence to intentionally create unpredictability? For example, tape on a road sign resulting in self-driving cars misidentifying the sign. So again, I think, I think that is a a perfect example of what an Article 36 legal review should be looking at. Not only whether um, a, a capability is compliant with IHL, but also making sure that it is protected from outside interference so that its use can be perverted. But you probably have a better technical background than me. Yes, I mean, um, work, work is being done to look at how to, uh, to defeat um, uh, autonomous self-driving self vehicles. And this is a, a very good example. And this is where research, development, understanding, but also looking at, at the wider context. So a autonomous car um, shouldn't be just looking at a sign, but it should also be able to interpret where it is, perhaps by GPS, looking at the roadmap and looking to be able to understand that this is where it needs to stop and, and give way. So it's not just a, uh, a, single, um, a single stimulus in which it makes a decision. And of course, this leads on to the point that we don't have fully autonomous systems yet. We have automated systems, but not uh, autonomous systems. And so um, the research development and the ongoing understanding is being done. And these are just the issues which need to be taken into account as part of the 30, Article 36 review. Wonderful. Thank you indeed. Uh, I think there's much more here to discuss, but in the interest of, so of time, I would suggest uh, to move on. Um, we have other questions uh, for our panelists, um, but now next up is um, uh, Dr. Monica Kaminska. Hello, Monica. Welcome to SciCon. Hi, Max. Nice to see nice you. Um, hello to everyone from the Cape. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, great. So, um, hopefully you can also see my slides. Yes, now we'll have them up. Uh, first, a little introduction uh, for you. Monica is a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Agro Program for Cyber Norms at Leiden University, Institute of Security and Global Affairs, and a PhD candidate in cybersecurity at the University of Oxford. Monica's research focus is in international cyber conflicts and state responses to style cyber operations. Monica, your paper, uh, co-authored with Fabio Cristiano and Dennis Breder, identify, identifies an issue of concern of states, namely automated malware that self-propagates to infect uh, uh, cyber infrastructures, and that provokes undesirable widespread damage and effects. So the paper advocates adopting a non-binding norm to review automated cyber operation in conditions short of armed conflict. 
on the law, uh, based on the law, uh, law of armed conflict obligation to distinguish between military objectives and civilian objectives. So it's, uh, I called it, you see, an exercise of the Lex Ferenda. But now, please, the floor is yours. Uh, we are all here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, so yes, I'll, um, this paper is co-authored with my colleague Fabio Cristiano and um, Dennis Broders. And I thought I'd just start with our observations that really motivated us to write about regulating automated cyber operations. And I should just stress here that we looked at automated, so not, all, not autonomous operations, um, like uh, Anna and Adrian were talking about before. So first of all, we noticed that states regard automated cyber operations as a problem. So in the case of NotPetya in 2017, which was perhaps the most infamous automated operation, the US and the UK both criticized the indiscriminate design of the operation um, and mentioned that in their attribution statements. And then in the UN open-ended working group, states like Brazil, Ecuador, and the Netherlands have also voiced their concerns about the uncontrolled spread of cyber operations. And the International Committee of the Red Cross in addressing the open-ended working group already stated that during armed conflict, the employment of cyber tools that spread and cause damage indiscriminately is prohibited. But the problem is, of course, that existing international humanitarian law does not regulate conduct below the threshold of armed conflict. So we don't have this kind of clarity for automated operations like NotPetya or also WannaCry, so operations that occurred below the threshold. And since we wrote the paper, the Microsoft Exchange hack happened. So discussing the regulation of automated cyber operations just seems all the more timely. So what's the main argument of the paper? Well, as Max already said, drawing inspiration from existing legal principles in IHL, we propose a new non-binding norm to address automated cyber attacks below the threshold of armed conflict. So essentially, we propose that states should design cyber operations so as to prevent them from indiscriminately inflicting damage. And as I said, the norm draws inspiration from international law, particularly the principle of distinction or discrimination, but it also deviates from it in one important respect. So as Anna already mentioned, the principle of distinction requires parties to armed conflicts to distinguish at all times between military objectives and civilian objects. Our proposed norm doesn't distinguish between lawful and unlawful objects as categories. Instead, any operation that does not seek to target a malware's payload at a particular system so that is an operation that lacks any form of distinction or discrimination would be considered a violation of the norm. So it's essentially a negative norm. And norms have been constructed in this way before. So for example, many of the norms in the 2015 UNGG report are reiterations of legal principles, such as the principle of due diligence or respect for human rights law. And it's important to note here that we're not actually international lawyers. So we're, what we're not doing in the paper is interpreting international law. We're instead proposing a new non-binding norm, merely drawing inspiration from IHL. So how would compliance with this norm look in practice? And to this end, we propose a normative review of automated cyber operations. And once again, we draw here inspiration from the legal review of weapons in IHL. And in coming up with this review, we actually came across an issue in detaching indiscriminate use from indiscriminate nature, which is something that is referred to in Article 36 of the Additional Protocol and also in the Talon Manual in its translation of existing law into a cyber context. We found that the distinction between the nature and the use of weapons is actually empty for automated cyber operations. And this is because automated cyber attacks propagate and detect unpatched vulnerabilities and deliver their payload automatically. So therefore their intentionality becomes a question of pure design. So in other words, if we were to also consider use, there is a risk that automation can become a justification for states to avoid responsibility. So the normative review that we propose would therefore prioritize an assessment of the design or nature of cyber capabilities over their use. And to comply with this new norm, states would undertake a review of each operation to ascertain that the design of the operation 
reflects their intent to limit uncontrolled harmful effects, including the destruction of data. So how could we hold norm violators accountable? The paper argued that the post-incident forensic analysis of an operation can allow third parties and victims to determine whether an attacker conformed to the norm with, re with regard to the operation's design and nature. And states can then use these forensic analyses to call out unacceptable behavior, which then helps set a normative benchmark. So what we did in the paper is we compared the NotPetya and Stuxnet operations to illustrate just how this could be done. So let's start with NotPetya. An analysis of NotPetya's initial method of delivery reveals that already at this stage, it was designed not to discriminate between systems. So the attackers compromised the software update system for the MEDOC financial application. And MEDOC is the most popular accounting software in Ukraine and is used widely by any organization that files taxes or conducts business in the country. So the attacker's choice of MEDOC as the attack vector already gives us a clue that the attackers might not have paid attention to distinguishing between targets. But it isn't yet enough to determine whether the operation was indiscriminate because from analyzing just this stage, we don't actually yet know if the attacker sought to exploit all the organizations that it accessed. So let's consider two subsequent stages of the operation. The lateral movement stage, when the adversary moves from one system to the next within the network, and the impact stage, where the malware's payload interrupts systems or destroys data. So in order to propagate across systems, NotPetya used two tools, a modified version of a tool called Mimikatz, which was used to steal login credentials from computer memory, and the eternal blue exploit, which allowed the attackers to remotely infect all the systems on a given network within minutes. And the malware also crucially had no mechanism to distinguish between targets prior to installing its payload. So once it had spread to a new host, it automatically scanned other systems for their vulnerability to eternal blue in order to automatically release its payload there as well. So these two stages, the lateral movement and impact stage taken together, indicate that the designers of NotPetya did not seek to limit in any way the uncontrolled harmful effects of the malware. Let's now look at Stuxnet, which famously targeted Iran's Natanz nuclear enrichment plant. And let's start again with the initial access stage. So the attackers recruited a mole to physically infect a USB flash drive with the malware, which was then plugged into the centrifuge systems at the plant. And we know from investigative reporting that the mole had visited Natanz a number of times in order to collect detailed information on the configuration of its systems prior to delivering the malware on the USB drive. And this allowed the attackers to update the code several times before launching the operation. An analysis of the intrusion vector for this first version of Stuxnet reveals that it was designed essentially as a precision attack. So the malware was injected into only one target network. In the second iteration of the operation, rather than using a mole, the attackers infected the systems of five unwitting external Natanz contractors. And this is actually what caused the malware to spread outside Natanz. So now we're looking at the lateral movement stage. Although the malware was designed to only propagate automatically in so-called trusted networks, the infection of the contractor's systems meant that the malware spread to the contractor's other customers and ultimately ended up infecting over 100,000 computer systems globally. But if we compare the lateral movement stages of the NotPetya and Stuxnet operation, there is one crucial difference. While the malware spread in both cases, Stuxnet did not destroy any systems that were not its intended target because it was designed to only deliver its payload to specific types of programmable logic controller devices. So when Stuxnet detected a series of specific configurations which verified its target system, it released its payload, causing the programmable logic controllers to run at different speeds. When it did not, it withheld the payload. So even though Stuxnet spread like a worm, it did not have the uncontrolled harmful effects as the malware did not automatically release the payload in systems outside of Natanz. 
So on this basis, we can conclude that because Stuxnet withheld its payload outside Natanz, the avoidance of indiscriminate harmful effects was integral to its design. So comparing NotPetya and Stuxnet, we can determine that the incorporation of propagation mechanisms into the malware in itself does not actually necessarily indicate the attacker's lack of intent to limit the operation. Instead, it was the propagation coupled with the malware's automatic release of the payload that showed the attacker's inattention to discrimination and would therefore constitute a violation of our proposed norm. So with that, um, I'll leave the presentation there and, and welcome any questions. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. My question. If the assumption in your paper is that a payload capable of distinction um, deployed in peacetime would not be unlawful because compliant with this non-binding norm, wouldn't such a norm implicitly admit the possibility to conduct chirurgical uh, cyber operation but nonetheless destructive in peacetime? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and it really gets to the issue of to what extent are destructive cyber operations, cyber operations with destructive effects ever permissible in peacetime? Um, so if we think about Stuxnet, um, I suspect that today states would refer to Stuxnet quite differently than they did um, back when it was discovered. So I think that what our you know, what our norms tries to do is to give states the tool that they seem to be needing. So they're really concerned about these um, indiscriminate cyber attacks. So it gives them a tool to call out indiscriminate cyber attacks and say, this is not okay because this contravenes this norm. That doesn't mean that, that these kinds of attacks, destructive attacks are okay. Um, it just means that states need other tools to address them. And I think those tools, many already exist, right? So, so states already, um, apply sovereignty in the use of force um, in calling out destructive uh, cyber attacks. So, um, yeah, I think that, that sort of covers it. Thank you indeed, Monica. Last but not least, we have the pleasure to have with us today, and we warmly welcome uh, Colonel retired Gary Korn. Welcome, Gary. Hello, Max. Hello. Gary is the director of the Technology, Law and Security Program and adjunct professor of cyber and national security law at the American University Washington College of Law. A senior fellow in cybersecurity and emerging threats at the R Street Institute and the founder and principal of Use Novum Consulting. As a U.S. Army um, colonel, he also served at the staff, as a staff judge advocate, general counsel to the U.S. Cyber Command. And besides this, and let me say it with a pinch of pride, Gary is also, together with Professor uh, Sean Watts, uh, the main instructor at the International Law of Cyber Operations course uh, organized by the uh, CCDCOE. So Gary, working with emerging technologies for several years, you published many articles on the topics addressed by the two papers uh, today, um, where under one perspective, you maintain that this new reality of artificial intelligence should not be seen necessarily um, solely, uh, viewed solely um, through a negative or alarmist lens, uh, while under another perspective, you, you often issued some sort of precautionary notes uh, to apply to new technologies, legal frameworks that are were developed in different eras and contexts. So I'm referring in particular to one article of yours, but there are many others on uh, cyber operation in the imperfect art of translating the law of war to new technologies. Uh, so Gary, please, the virtual stage is yours. Again, thanks, Max. Uh, thanks to SciCon for letting me participate today. Um, and more importantly, congratulations to my fellow presenters, panelists for their very thoughtful and thought-provoking papers um, and really excellent presentations. A uh, little slight note of clarification um, to the introduction, and thanks for the kind words, Max, but uh, my, my writing has focused mostly on cyber operations, cyber capabilities as a new technology and emerging technology. I have not delved into the really challenging and difficult area of artificial intelligence, um, and especially within the law of armed conflict framework. Um, 
So let me get that acknowledgement out there. Although I think some of what I'm going to talk about um, does have applicability. And I, and I note, and I sort of um, congratulate Anastasia and Adrian in their, their cautionary note itself, I think, in, in the tenor of the, uh, the article and the presentation, that, that there may be um, positive uses to this capability. We are not at a stage yet where we should be drawing hard line conclusions about whether this artificial intelligence can be used in various ways as part of um, armed conflict, legally or unlawfully. But there, we need to develop this further um, before we make these these calls. So, you know, I would agree with that. Um, in can contrast to the great presentations, um, you know, Max. We, we've worked together for some years now. Uh, I want to congratulate him for all his work at SciCon and, and in the International Law of Cyber Operations course. But he said he's, he's a very balanced individual. Balance matters to him very much. And so he said, I need somebody to regress the overall quality of the presentation to the mean. And so he invited me to come and speak in contrast to the great presentations you've seen so far. Um, and so I, I, I don't have a paper that I wrote for this, this presentation, nor, and quite surprisingly, as a U.S. Army officer recently retired, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. So um, I hope you'll forgive me for the transgression um, as I talk, take a few minutes and just kind of offer, um, I, I wouldn't say to completely different, I'd say slightly different on, on certain levels, um, perspective on some of these things. But, but also I hear resonance in both presentation with, with some of the thoughts that I've, I've got about this. Um, so, you know, it's great to be here. I wish I was, it was not virtual. I wish I was in Talon. Instead, I'm stuck with the very disconcerting and eerie hum of the 17 year cicada invasion in the Washington area right now, if any of you are tracking that. Um, but here we are at SciCon, uh, you know, probably the most important forum for discussing the the aspects and implications of cyber conflict and the theme going viral, you know, is interesting. I think if you were to go back and look at SciCon from the beginning, and I found this as I've tracked sort of certainly cyber operations um, in, in my career, you'd see that it was far more a discussion of the <clears throat> the theoretical, the hypothetical at the beginning, whereas now cyber operations truly have gone viral, right? There's viral aspects to them, but they've gone viral. And just since December, we're wrestling with solar winds. We're wrestling with the Microsoft Exchange server event. We are, you know, attribution is still sort of out there right now, but we just, um, you know, I couldn't fill up my, my gas tank for several days to a week because of the the hack into the colonial pipeline uh you know system in the united states and i saw at least one report or statistic that no less than 10 major cyber events in the first quarter of 2021 right it, it's just happening at a in a scale level um and and this is not abating it, it's only getting worse at a certain level um and so with this accelerating problem and, and notwithstanding the increasingly robust dialogue that we've had over the years, we've had two talent manuals, we've had the GGE process, the open-ended working group, we have an increasing number of states making official pronouncements, um, sort of bringing some greater clarity to the, the ambiguous of sp space of international law and cyber. Um, that, that just hasn't slowed, unfortunately, what's been happening, right? Um, so states have obviously figured out that cyber capabilities and operations are a lucrative tool in their state craft kit bag. And some are using that tool far more aggressively than others and recklessly. Um, but that's, like I said, unlikely to change anytime soon. And so sort of with that is some background context what I'd like to offer, um, it, as Max said, is a couple of cautionary notes along four maybe overlapping lines. But, um, you know, one is a note of caution on expecting too much 
from the law and the work it can do and should do when thinking about how to address the reality of cyber threats and conflict. Um, a second is a note of caution about the challenge and limits of applying law by analogy or translation, right, to the point of the article you referenced, Max. Um, a third is caution about the real risks at times of overextending specific bodies or rules of international law beyond their intended scope or application. And as I'll talk about, sometimes um, that brings in inherent risk itself. At other times, that uh, might be overly constraining uh, in, the, in the face of dealing with these threats. Um, and then over precipitous and broad regulation can come with opportunity cost. I think this is part of the first presentation, um, right? There, there could be humanitarian benefits to AI, as was brought out in that discussion. There, uh, you know, I wrote a piece for the ICRC blog a few years ago. There, there, there are some very real humanitarian compliant uses of cyber operations and capabilities. And so eschewing them outright or over or overstating that um, has an opportunity cost to as well. Um, I, I'm going to try and preserve as much time for questions as possible because I know we're running toward the end of this. But let me just say, too, that I, I'm not arguing against international law. I'm a firm believer in the importance of international law. I, I've worked with it. I've applied it. I teach it. I write about it. Um, I've made arguments for good faith extension of certain international law principles, um, sort of in, for example, in the area of regulating uh, state strategic deception activities, um, you know, a, a growing and acute problem that we see right now. The rules-based international order is, you know, fundamental and has been for the last 80 years. But we also have to understand, um, as I said, that I also come at this and without opening the debate stage for the question of the role of sovereignty in cyberspace, um, a quintessential act of, of sovereign prerogative is states' lawmaking function, right? The question of international law is reserved to states. States make it, and it's up to states to evolve it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, at risk of borrowing too much from a, a phrase often used in our own internal constitutional debates in the United States, you know, international law is not a suicide pact. It has to be practical and functional um, in responding to uh, the, the threats out there that we face. So, you know, real quickly, and we can take this on in the questions, but let, let's just take the first point of expecting too much from the law. Uh, one, I've seen at a macro level, um, you know, international law uh, as a deterrent force. There's some truth to that, uh, but I think that that gets overstated. Compliant states are compliant not because of fear of retribution, but because they're generally law-abiding states. And the states that are non-compliant are non-compliant because they're not concerned about consequences of violating international law. And so absent sort of cost mechanisms and compliance mechanisms, um, international law is, is certainly weakened. And unfortunately, the way the system has evolved since 1949, it is very much dependent on sort of self-help remedies in the structure um, and a commitment to sort of backing and implementing these rules. So I take a look at, for example, Russia. One can argue, um, as Monica indicated, most activity is happening below or outside of armed conflict, below the threshold of the use of force in international law. Isn't that indication that it's having a deterrent effect. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think that that's, uh, you know, states like Russia, who are the primary threat actors, see that as the equivalent of a red line that they don't want to cross, not that they're compliant with law or concerned with the legal implications of what they're doing. And the not petty operation is a, is a prime example of that. Um, and we can touch on that in a second. Um, so I do think it has a tempering effect, but it has limitations. At the micro level, and we can talk, I, I also take the Article 36 discussion, a lot to, lot to unpack there, but I don't know that it can do the full extent of work um, that, that was you know, part of both presentations in, in this circumstance. 
I think it has a far more limited scope of what it, it is intended to do. And we certainly know that um, states observe it more. There's a, a small number of states that actually go through Article 36 review processes, notwithstanding the number of states that are legally bought by, bound to under Article 36 uh, itself. Um, the, the translation point and the caution there, yes, I think uh, that, that international law is adaptable. It's made to be adaptable, certainly the law of armed conflict. But there are times where there are limits to that. Um, and then sort of overextension of these principles um, can have constraining effect. I've seen this, for example, in efforts to try and transport collateral damage estimate processes and methodologies from armed conflict sort of planning scenarios into non-armed conflict. And it's just sort of inapt. Within armed conflict, the proportionality rule is set and defined by law, and that's the baseline of a collateral damage estimate process. Outside of armed conflict and even in armed conflict for um, a number of different operations with cyber effects that don't reach the Article 49 threshold, it's a matter of policy and command intent that drives what limitations should be in place. Um, and so sometimes overextending can be a problem. And then, you know, just for time's sake, uh, I'll say I, I do have some concern. The, the DOD law of war policy has tried to address the the sort of law void or gap question for years in a policy that extended um, the law of war, adherence to the law of war, to all operations, right? Any um, conflicts, however, however characterized, and beyond. That also raises difficult concerns and questions about transporting the concepts of military necessity and the related uh, rule of military objective into non-armed conflict scenarios where it has no place. The extraordinary circumstance of being able to target for lethal effect or destructive effect certain things um, is very much limited to the Lex Specialis circumstance of the law of armed conflict and should not be brought over too, too quickly into, into areas where it, it doesn't apply. There's a lot more I could tease out there um, on all of these. Time's running short. We have two minutes or so. So I will stop there, Max, and, and leave it for questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Uh, before we I have a few minutes, three minutes left for questions, but we receive on the chat one question uh, for Monica uh, on NotPetia. On Not there were some check against certain endpoint detection uh, systems, meaning it did not launch its payload in any environment. So the question is, there was, was this a form of, of restraint? I mean, I don't think anyone could really claim that not Petya was in any way restrained, right? Um, it, it spread globally, it affected companies which surely were outside of its, its target systems. Um, so I think even if there were certain um, additional measures put in place, it, it definitely was you know, it's widely regarded as, as one of the most indiscriminate cyber operations to date. Thank you very much, Monica. So I believe our time is, um, is up now. Uh, thanks to our speakers and thanks to you all for tuning in. Uh, whilst they probably won't hear you, please, I would like to join us. I would like you to join us in a virtual applause to our speakers because they really did great papers and they did great talks. Um, after now, we'll, in the next session, after 20 minutes of break, uh, there will be a panel on the impact on this inf of disinformation on societies and uh, and the alliances. So I thank you all for being with us, and um, please stay, stay tuned. Thank you very much. <laughs>